Welcome to the Spark Live webinar series, one component of our Spark Knowledge Mobilization Program. Spark is Children's Healthcare Canada's shared platform for advocacy, research, and knowledge. Spark Live is where we gather each week to curate, convene, and showcase excellence and innovation from across the child and youth healthcare community. Our goal is to spark conversation, ideas, and action. Children's Healthcare Canada would like to thank our funding partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of our programs and activities, including this Spark Live bi-weekly webinar series. There are two options to join in on the live conversation. Questions and comments for our panel or presenters can be typed into the question box, or comments that you want to share with the audience can be typed into the chat box visible to all of our attendees. For those of you on Twitter, tag at ChildHealthCan on any webinar-related tweets or use the hashtag SparkLive. And to keep up to date on all of Children's Healthcare Canada's webinars and other activities, be sure to sign up for our weekly Spark News e-bulletin by visiting our website at childhealthcan.ca. Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live webinar series. This month, the Spark theme relates to immunization, and I'm Paula Robeson, your host for the next hour. Children's Healthcare Canada acknowledges that our offices, located in Ottawa, are on the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. We recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place. We also recognize the contributions that Métis, Inuit, and other Indigenous peoples have made in shaping and strengthening this community, our province, and the country. Today, during our Immunization Month, we're delighted to bring you this webinar, Facts Approach to Vaccine Confidence in COVID and Beyond, a focus on children. I would like to introduce our speaker for today. Dr. Carrie Robinson is the Executive Director of the Vaccine Confidence Division in the Vaccine Rollout Task Force of the Public Health Agency of Canada. Kerry has worked in public health research, practice, and policy for 25 years, including on COVID since the pandemic began. Outside of work, Kerry loves to spend time outdoors with her family in the Ottawa area. Just a reminder that we record all of our webinars. As mentioned in the introductory video, please type your questions into the question box at any time, and I'll prompt you via the chat as well. I'll pose your questions to our guests following their, the presentation. It is now my pleasure to pass the mic to Dr. Carrie Robinson. So good morning, everyone. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak. Um, we've been a partner with the Children's Healthcare Canada for some time and very happy to um, share with you today some of the work that the Public Health Agency of Canada is undertaking together with partners to support vaccine confidence across Canada uh, for COVID and beyond. And really today we will talk uh, and focus in on, on pediatrics. So just wanted to give you a little bit of an outline here in terms of where we're going to go in the next few minutes and then looking forward to the discussion period, but wanting to give you a picture of some of the work that we have under development, um, as well as, you know, what the role is of the federal government in the space of vaccination and how we are undertaking various efforts with partners to support pediatric vaccination and, and confidence. And, and there's a number of factors that we need to understand that are at play in terms of what comes into the decision-making and, and the types of um, the considerations that people are looking at when they're thinking about vaccination and their children and making those choices, as well as some of the work that uh, we're looking ahead towards. So just wanted to outline here um, some of the key developments around what pediatric vaccines are available in Canada. Of course, we have had now approval from Health Canada for uh, children ages 5 to 11 um, late last fall um, for the Pfizer and BioNTech um, vaccine. We also have um, guidance that came out from the National Advisory Committee on Immunization to help support the most optimal use of this vaccine. What we're seeing is pretty high efficacy from the Pfizer vaccine, uh, of course, during the Delta wave, but uh, the, st the protection still holds. And so that's very positive um, for, for children in Canada. As you know, Moderna uh, spike back vaccine was also very recently approved for children ages 6 to 11. We currently have um, underway auth authorization review for vaccines for children six months to four years or six months to five years of age, depending on the vaccine. And those decisions have not yet been made. Did want to highlight to you um, and spend a little bit of time to talk about vaccine development in Canada and the review and approval processes. So you can see that it's quite a multi-phased approach. 
Um, and what we see is that Canada has a very strong and established uh, regulatory system for reviewing drugs, uh, medications of all types, including vaccines. And the process begins with, and there was a big race in Canada um, and the world, in fact, um, in extensive global collaboration on the development of vaccines for COVID-19 um, that developed, developed a number of different vaccine platforms that begins with the exploratory phase and preclinical trials. And then you can see through the clinical trials, we talk about them as phases, that there are tens of volunteers to start. And then as it moves through the different phases, it ends up with thousands of volunteers being participants in those studies. And those studies are undertaken by the, the vaccine manufacturers that then submit um, to Canada, as well as other regulatory um, bodies for approval and review of the evidence on their efficacy. That means how well they work in the trial setting, their safety, their quality and the manufacturing processes that are undertaken. The next phase of vaccine development review and approval you can see is where Health Canada um, steps in in terms of the scientific review. For the COVID-19 vaccines, Health Canada did use an expedited process that allowed manufacturers to submit rolling data along the way of the vaccine's development and in particular through those different phases of trials. So that allows Health Canada more time to review all of that data. And there's been significant international collaboration that um, Kent Health Canada works with other regulator regulators in the world to share that information from multiple sources in order to ensure that we have a full and comprehensive picture. I do want to highlight that there's no skipping of steps in the expedited process. What it means is that we have access to data earlier and Health Canada invested additional resources in terms of scientific expertise in order to um, process that uh, vaccine review and regulatory process in a faster time period out of a pandemic. And that's in order to make sure that we are um, happy data to ensure that it is safe, that it works, that it meets the manufacturing standards and to assess and determine if the benefits of the vaccine outweigh the risks. So following those approvals, then the government of Canada does work to uh, purchase and coordinate the delivery and the logistics of those vaccines that are then brought into Canada. And we work very closely with provinces and territories to then distribute the vaccines, support their use through um, evidence-based guidance and policies. The other um, important step to highlight here is just the um, incredible and um, over 20 and 30 year um, lifespan of our monitoring system around the safety and the benefits of vaccines. So there's a number of different surveillance and monitoring systems that Health Canada and the Public Health Agency of Canada undertake together with provinces and territories supported by healthcare providers who are an important part of that um, safety and monitoring system. We wanted to spend a little bit of time to show sort of a snapshot of what vaccine coverage and uptake looks like in Canada right now. So we have um, populations and vaccines available for those five years and older, as I mentioned, and Canada's doing very well with the uptake of one dose and two doses of vaccines. So we can see here for the population as a whole in terms of five and over, we have over 86% of the population have received their second dose. And in terms of booster doses, so a third dose, about 57% of the population 18 and up have received a booster dose. The National Advisory Committee on Immunization, who I've mentioned just before, continues to provide updated guidance um, and recommendations based on evidence, global, um, the global real world evidence that we have available in terms of the millions of individuals that have received vaccines across the world as well as very close tracking of the data in Canada in terms of vaccine effectiveness and coverage. And what we're seeing is that there is, are some trends where we have lower vaccine uptake among some populations. Um, we've seen lower uptake in certain regions of the country. So you can see those regional differences on the map here, where some of our northern and uh, rural areas have lower vaccine uptake. We've also seen lower uptake amongst Indigenous communities and some racialized population groups. And we know that this does vary across the country by socioeconomic status as well. In terms of children and youth, we have um, began that vaccination campaign for COVID-19 in uh, late, late November, early December, 2021. To date, we have almost 57% of children five to 11 that have received at least one dose and coming up to 40% that are fully vaccinated. You can see for teens who were able to access vaccines last um, late spring and summer, then we have 88%, so good high level of vaccine coverage for at least one dose. 
Um, I think it's more about 84% for two doses. And then for boosting, um, some provinces and territories have opened boosters up to youth 12 to 17. Others um, have not yet. We expect the National Advisory Committee on Immunization to have updated guidance um, on boosters for adults as well as adolescents in the coming days. The main point here that I wanted to highlight is that because of these variations in vaccine uptake, it is important for us to take a tailored approach um, when this culturally appropriate, evidence-based, and, and suited to the needs and context of different communities across the country in terms of ensuring that we understand the social, physical, and other types of barriers that may be um, at play in terms of reducing vaccine uptake and protection. To continue our spotlight on, on pediatric vaccination, there's a number of reasons that are um, behind parents' hesitancy or guardians' hesitancy around getting children vaccinated. And they can just see here, there's a panel, uh, uh, sorry, a, qu uh, a question, another poll that's just come up. So looking to see if um, your children or your patients um, have, um, have had any impacts on your immunization schedule. And if you can answer that poll, and we'll take a look at the results in terms of the positive or negative impact. But just to continue around parents' hesitancy, we've seen it from a number of different recent surveys that about 20% of parents who have not yet had their children vaccinated are unsure um, and not sure if they want to have their children vaccinated at some point. So there, there's that's what we might call the movable middle of parents that haven't yet done it and they're still thinking. We know that there's a portion of parents that are waiting and seeing and not feeling urgency, a number of factors behind that, including concerns about safety of the vaccines themselves, wanting to see more children vaccinated or more data available before they make those decisions, and maybe not feeling that it's urgent to have their child vaccinated just yet. The reasons behind that we've seen from public opinion research include that um, people have beliefs that their children have healthy immune systems and that their natural immunity can help protect them against COVID-19, or that they feel that um, the Omicron variant is a milder version and therefore they're not worried about the health impacts for their children. Unfortunately, while the majority of children do, if they do get COVID-19, have experienced mild illness, there certainly are a subset of children not all entirely based on underlying conditions that have experienced more significant health impacts that have resulted in hospitalization, unfortunately. And as well, there is the risk of long COVID. So we can see there, um, thank you for the, the responses to that poll, that um, about 21% have seen a negative impact in terms of routine vaccination for children. Um, but we're seeing you know, some positive signs there, but a third saying it didn't impact the schedule. And, and some that actually experienced a positive impact in terms of being able to access routine immunization. What we're hoping is that, um, that parents will continue to, um, to access primary care and access opportunities for routine vaccination. And that in those conversations, they can talk about the routine childhood vaccinations as well as COVID vaccines, because this will be part of a, you know, it's likely to be that uh, we're gonna need to live with COVID for some time like the flu, like other vaccine preventable diseases. And um, in that case, then it will mean that the vaccination will continue to be a really important tool in our toolbox to help prevent and mitigate significant harms from COVID-19. You can see on this slide that we've also highlighted some of the key areas of information that parents have identified that they need to help build their confidence and support decisions around vaccination, including information on safety, understanding what the right timing is or the interval between the first and second dose, or also following um, confirmed or suspected COVID infection. So there, there, the National Advisory Committee on Immunization did put out guidance that there should be at least eight weeks uh, between the first and second dose of a COVID-19 vaccine, and uh, you know between eight and 12 weeks, depending on the circumstances, between uh, a COVID vaccine, sorry, between infection of, with COVID and vaccination. And that's really because it actually allows the child's immune system to build a stronger protection to allow more time in between doses. And that's something that actually we've learned from decades of research on immunization and immunology. Um, and it's been an important contribution that Canadians have made to, um, to this space and to these types of immunization decisions that we have benefited from as a country as a whole. You can see there that there's also a need to know more about the approval process of so some of what I explained in terms of how vaccines are developed, 
reviewed by Health Canada, authorized, and then monitored. And finally, understanding and supporting comfortable vaccination experiences. Before we go into the next slide, I do want to highlight that this concept of misinformation or disinformation um, is has been an important factor in terms of influencing parents' thinking about vaccination, along with um, you know, considerations around the convenience of vaccination, around um, the uh, calculation of risk and the level of risk um, between COVID and vaccines, which we know that the risks of COVID-19 outcomes significantly outweighs the risk, the rare risks of, um, of vaccination side effects um, that are significant or serious in nature. And so it's really important to contextualize that for parents. Moving on to mis and disinformation. Um, this misinformation is where information is spread that unintentionally that is actually false um, and not spread on purpose, but that people, you know, take information and say, oh, that sounds um, important. I better share that with others and not realizing that it's actually not true. Um, second one is disinformation, where people are, are uh, people, um, robots and otherwise, are spreading information intentionally in order to raise money, cause harm, or initiate panic. And we have seen through COVID-19 our first experience of a pandemic during an infodemic where we have significant and rapid sharing of information, both accurate and inaccurate. And unfortunately, social media has been a, a leading source of misinformation. And it's really important for us to look at the source of information that we're receiving to make sure it's from trustworthy sources like health professionals, health organizations and governments um, to ensure that what we're sharing and using is actually um, accurate um, and scientific based. And we've got a little bit of some examples here to highlight around how to fight misinformation and examples of the sources of this, that it's actually quite interesting that less than a dozen organizations internationally are responsible for the majority of misinformation that's being spread about vaccination. Um, and over half of Canadians have actually um, shared information without knowing if it was accurate. And our ability to detect if something is inaccurate is quite typically difficult. And that's because there's so much information and so many sources coming at a very fast pace that sometimes hard to classify what is false and what is true. Um, so we know that um, from the polling that the belief in misinformation is an example of something that can really influence parents' decisions. And so, for example, it's really important for us to kind of verify and double check our facts. We've got um, some great work by the WHO, by, the, by Canada and many other countries to try to dispel myths about COVID-19 vaccines. For example, there's been myths that the COVID-19 mRNA vaccines can affect our DNA or that COVID-19 um, vaccines can inject microchips into our bodies. And those are uh, very much false and not true. Um, and that has been spread in order to, to, to incite fear and, re and reluctance to get vaccinated. But things like this type of fact sheet that debunk those myths and clarify that um, the COVID-19 vaccines do not interact with our DNA or they do not contain contain um, contain live virus, those types of things um, in the case of the vaccines that we have developed here, or that uh, women can take vaccines um, while they're breastfeeding, um, or individuals while pregnant um, can take the vaccines and in fact um, get much higher protection from the COVID vaccines against the negative outcomes of COVID-19 that can be experienced in pregnancy. And pregnancy does come with higher risk of those negative impacts, both to the, the pregnant individual as well as to their, to their child, their baby. In the space of, of vaccination, I wanted to share that there's a whole bunch of different partners that are working together behind the scenes and in front of some scenes too. So we have the federal government, which I'm here on behalf of with the Public Health Agency of Canada. And we're responsible for, as I mentioned, uh, reviewing and authorizing, approving the use of vaccines, developing guidance, um, purchasing on behalf of other governments, vaccines for Canada, and, and then help to support their delivery and, and use across the country, including doing that important work about surveillance on safety and supporting programs that also help um, support uptake of vaccines and reduce access barriers. Provinces and territories are responsible for delivering vaccinations to their populations, including with their local health authorities, 
which may look a bit different depending on each of the provinces or territories, but they're really responsible for implementing those vaccination plans and administering vaccines. And we have Indigenous partners and peoples that work together with federal, provincial, territorial governments to support community-led approaches, to support culturally safe immunization. And the Indigenous partners have been such a huge part of the success of Canada's rollout um, to reach communities from coast to coast to coast and to support culturally appropriate access to vaccination. And then we've got a number of different expert advisors and international collaborators, healthcare providers being really, really important um, partners in vaccination, as well as we've been very benefited from having um, a range of, of diverse community organizations and partners that are non-traditional partners in, in public health that have really been a part of the uh, COVID response across the country, including uh, vaccination. So just wanted to share with you um, that our approach to support vaccine confidence has been phased um, uh, in the space of pediatric vaccination, ensuring confidence in the you know, authorization and the regulatory review of vaccines um, and providing the information on safety throughout, including wanting to reinforce um, confidence and immunity, um, including addressing access barriers to um, continuing to address the vaccine hesitancy and priority populations which has been a really important strategy because we know that not one size fits all and that um, people do have different beliefs, um, different geographic and economic and social factors that influence access to and acceptance of vaccination. And we're also uh, planning for work to help catch up on routine childhood vaccinations because we know those in many cases have been disrupted, including um, based on your responses today. So the Government of Canada has a multi-pronged approach to supporting vaccine confidence and uptake. Um, part of what we do is work with healthcare provider organizations at a national level, as well as other partners to provide training, guidance and tools to healthcare providers to help support them to be um, important champions of informed vaccination decisions with their patients and clients. We do undertake um, projects and support and invest in projects at national levels and at local levels. Um, in fact, over 100 projects we'll talk a little bit more about across the country. We're also engaging and doing outreach with a number of stakeholder networks and partners, including Children's Healthcare Canada and many others, to support and equip um, with vaccine confidence information. And it's important that we also have evidence-based communications around vaccination. So there's a number of different campaigns that we've been doing as a federal government that as well complement those efforts from provinces and territories and Indigenous partners. And finally, all the work that we're doing is based on evidence uh, from vaccine science to also public opinion research so that we can understand the social health and diverse factors that support or challenge vaccination in Canada. Here's some examples from our Immunization Partnership Fund of projects that we have funded um, and continue to fund across the country. We're really aiming to build the capacity of healthcare providers to support community-based education and outreach and to build capacity for evidence-based communication. There's some examples that we've highlighted here, including Science Up First, uh, which is really focused on mis- and disinformation. Um, Elmer, which is uh, the this, this, this safety elephant being a champion for um, curriculum and resources for schools and school-based education around vaccination, and many others that include working with um, at-risk populations and underserved, whether it's homeless individuals, individuals living with HIV, um, Indigenous populations, uh, faith-based and community, uh, racialized community organizations across the country. So very proud to be working with such a strong set of partners because we know that it's trusted voices of community leaders that in fact is where many people get information um, and supports to make decisions that are really critical to their health. An important part of this also, part of our toolbox to combat misinformation and disinformation is around building health and digital literacy. This is valuable for vaccination, but it's also valuable for a whole range of health issues that um, we know affect children and youth and families. Really uh, coming back to those themes of finding reliable sources of information, we've highlighted here an example. We have an Ask the Expert video series and campaign where experts do really short videos um, that highlight some key information and maybe dispel some myths. We've got um, a number of other campaigns, but really we would ask all of you in any role that you may be in to, to be a community leader and to, to be a champion to share that kind of credible and evidence-based information on vaccination. 
another key pillar and part of our strategy is work on communications and public education and stakeholder engagement. So you can see here that there's a number of examples of campaigns that we have launched um, to support pediatric vaccination. Um, just finished some campaigns uh, that were in the field from February and March, and we'll continue to um, develop campaigns that build in thinking about routine vaccination for children um, and addressing some of those areas where we know parents are looking for more information. It's really important that information though is, is passed on through partners um, because we know the federal government alone um, will not be enough to uh, counter some of the mis and disinformation that's out there. The other work that we do is we are informed by a vaccine confidence advisory network and um, an expert group that brings a very diverse set of views to help inform what's happening on the ground, um, what some of the concerns and perspectives are, and what effective approaches we can take together to help address some of the um, considerations around vaccine confidence. Wanted to highlight here some of the considerations around engaging parents on vaccination. Some of these factors have been more important at different stages of our, our vaccine role, including return to school and activities earlier in this year as things opened back up. We know that there are um, individuals and families that have some pre-existing vaccine hesitancy, perhaps from previous experiences, that there's distrust um, in systems as sometimes based on racism and other mistrust in government. Individuals can have pain and needle fear and, um, and that there's a real need for sort of a tailored approach to campaigns and resources focused on safety, focused on helping people understand the balance of risks and that children are better off having the protection of vaccination and that natural immunity is not enough, including um, getting COVID-19 does provide some short-term um, protection or what we would call acquired immunity, but it's the longer term protection that vaccines can help boost and increase and make that last longer, including against multiple variants that are really important for our efforts. So just wanted to stop here and highlight some examples of the work we have coming ahead in terms of better understanding the trends and, and the factors that are influencing vaccine confidence, continuing to engage healthcare providers, some of which are maybe part of today's webinar, and also identifying some of the best practices from the many projects that we have been partnering with diverse community organizations with across the country to help improve our work over time and uh, share those best practices so that we can um, influence effective approaches in the months and weeks ahead. And finally, there's work beyond COVID-19, again, on routine vaccination, on influenza campaigns, and the renewal of Canada's national immunization strategy for the long term. So with that, I will turn it back to you, Paula. Thank you, Carrie, for a fabulous presentation. Um, we can see a number of questions that have come in. It's my chance to prompt you for any last minute questions you want to type away. Um, Allison says, it's not really a question, but um, a point of discussion, she guesses. Um, she believes that the hesitation around COVID-19 and all the misinformation about the vaccine is going to lead to further vaccine he hesitancy apart from the COVID-19 vaccine, so affecting routine uh, immunizations. Um, healthcare providers are likely to be, uh, have to be much more prepared for deeper questions and discussions and uh, wondering what advice you have for healthcare providers in that regard. That's a really important question. And in fact, something that we are um, wanting to track very closely. So there's some surveys that will be undertaken this spring that will help get us a picture of routine vaccination in, in Canada for children, as well as for adults. It will help also equip us with some of the reasons behind or, or some of the indications around whether some of the vaccine misinformation is affecting um, um, Canadians' views about other vaccines. Healthcare providers will be really critical to those conversations. And I think some of the focus should continue to be on helping to inform parents with the information, fact-based information on the safety of vaccines, um, the timing and the need for different doses, um, how vaccines are developed and approved in Canada, and sort of the delivery pr process or some of the ways in which vaccine experiences can be made more positive um, for Canadians. We actually are working on uh, webinars uh, around having conversations with parents. So this is really timely and we can help promote that to um, Children's Healthcare Can and, and webinar participants. So those will be coming up shortly that kind of talk about the best practices on how to have those conversations with parents 
as well as some of the key messages and the types of Q's and A's that might come up. So we have a vaccine confidence information bulletin that we put out every month. And that includes um, a number of resources and information to support healthcare providers in those conversations, which we know are going to be really important um, in the weeks and months ahead. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, another question. Can you speak to the recent data from New York that suggests vaccine efficacy degrades to only 12% against illness and 48% against hospitalization? This was the U.S. data with a three-week interval. Do we have any data from Canada with the eight-week in interval? I don't have the exact stats in front of me right now, but one thing I can say is that um, we do have extensive um, analysis that has come from BC, Ontario, and Quebec who've done in-depth studies over thousands and thousands of individuals that have been vaccinated in Canada. As I mentioned, and, and this question highlights, Canada in general did use a higher or longer interval in, in its vaccination approach for COVID-19 of, of eight weeks, in some cases up to 12 and 16 weeks, I think was the maximum perhaps used last spring when we had didn't have enough vaccine for everyone at all at the same time for two doses. But what we do know from that data is that um, the data in Canada demonstrates that we have um, higher levels of protection, that the, the spacing and the time between the two doses allowed for that. And it also allows for longer longer lasting um, benefits from an immunity perspective. We can certainly follow up to get some of the more specific statistics that in comparison to the New York study. But certainly what we're seeing is that some countries have had to use multiple boosters or rounds of boosters are boosted sooner than we have in Canada. And partly that is a result of us having stronger immunity and longer lasting immunity as a result of the extended interval. So that's been um, quite a positive benefit in, in Canada's strategy that has been borne out in the vaccine effectiveness data and the duration of that as well. It's always great to hear positives throughout all this. Um, Alexandra asks, um, sorry, Catherine asks, uh, are the, um, she, she's looking for the live link on ways to identify and debunk misinformation. So if Simon perhaps could type that into the chat box for folks, um, that'd be great. Another question, how do we fight complacency without scaring patients um, or parents, sorry? More than half of the pediatric admissions to hospitals have occurred in the last three months. Yeah, I think, and, and complacency is um, a challenging term because it can sound like, um, People are being complacent and they just don't really feel that there's a risk. But um, I think people are trying to process a number of different risks at the same time. And so they're thinking, well, you know, there's been mostly mild cases that I'm seeing around me, but we don't actually hear those stories, uh, uh, you know, with our friends and family, unless people have been directly affected. We don't get to see that big picture about um, the proportion of, of children that have been in the hospital or the increasing trend in that, especially because we had so many so many different um, children and youth and adults that experienced um, Omicron over the last number of months. And just by sheer numbers game, even if this variant is not as severe as previous ones, proportionally having so many people infected means that some of those are going to experience more severe um, cases sometimes as a result of underlying conditions. I think it's important to kind of lay out um, the bigger picture that, that we're, it is not, it's you know, a bit of a myth that, that children can't experience um, significant and severe COVID or that um, there aren't examples, um, unfortunately many examples of, of Canadians and individuals and children being hospitalized. And in particular, that risk of some of the complications of COVID-19 and long COVID, those are things that we wanna completely avoid the risk of and getting vaccinated is just one really important way to do that. It's not the only way, but it's a really important way with other layers of protection. So I think talking about some of the successes of vaccination and what we've been able to achieve in Canada, that we've been able to actually prevent quite a few hospitalizations as a result of vaccination, preventing deaths, that's really important part of the messaging that we can be sharing with patients. And ultimately, we want to give them the information and have them make those decisions. Um, as we do for, for all health issues. But it's really important to share that bigger picture. And, and if healthcare providers have some of those examples that they can share in their practice or 
or in um, their hospital experience, it's really important to convey that because it's easy to, for people just to see what, what is around them um, and, and maybe not understand the significant impact that it can have. Thank you. Catherine asks or says, telling people that their belief system is not based on scientific truth is often not enough. Do you have resources on how to have those discussions? In fact, that's exactly what one of our upcoming webinars um, is going to be focusing on is the conversations with, with parents. Um, and so we can highlight that, that we're going to have some resources on that front as well. Um, and so part of it is um, also just including some questions around, you know, understanding what some of those beliefs are. So that webinar actually goes through a couple of different scenarios um, that are kind of look at the, the patient as a whole, as a person, and kind of talk through. So there's examples of questions that we can ask um, about, you know, why someone thinks something or what the what concern they might have, how it relates to other things, what, what is important to them. So to kind of understand um, if, you know, being able to, for their children to continue in activities safely is important for them or understanding if there's someone else in the household that may have underlying conditions or helping them to see what the connections are between some of those risks. Those are the kinds of techniques that can help um, have those conversations. But absolutely, the kind of language that um, you're speaking to um, about um, you know, not using language to say that their belief system is not based on science, that's something that will close down a conversation, but there are some techniques um, and they'll be included in the slides and other resources around how to the kind of opening questions or probing questions that can be asked to help guide those conversations. And, and I'll add uh, that in addition to that very important webinar that you're talking about, um, we've had similar webinars with um, folks like Dr. Cora Contonescu, and we can provide links to that in the uh, on the webpage uh, where you can access the recording. Um, our, uh, you mentioned that um, we're likely to see COVID for a while and that we may have uh, to have booster shots, much like we have for the flu. Is there discussion about incorporating the vaccines into routine uh, childhood immunization schedules? There's definitely conversations about um, the timing of vaccines for children and, you know, co-administration and, you um, what we need to have a better sense of is that the, the virus is changing quite a bit. And so um, there's quite a bit of work, a number of different vaccines that are under development that, that use multivalent um, formulations or bivalent where they can incorporate, can incorporate multiple strains, multiple um, avenues, if you will, into one vaccine. So I can't say that it's being bundled into other vaccines, under other non-COVID vaccines, that's not um, underway at this time. But certainly, we think that coming into the fall, it's going to be really important for every encounter with healthcare providers to be an encounter that can involve a conversation about either routine vaccination, but also um, COVID-19 vaccination, having the conversation about openly about all the different kinds of factors or considerations that a parent may be uh, or guardian may be thinking about. Great, thanks. Dinesh says, um, sh you mentioned uh, non-traditional partners. Are there communities with higher, and you've alluded to communities with higher rates of, of uh, or lower rates of vaccine uptake, but with higher rates of, uh, are there communities with higher rates of hesitancy that could be reached through a variety of community organizations that typically work or rep with them or represent them? And how can such organizations be supported? That's a really great question and um, absolutely critical. What we've seen through the course of the pandemic and in particular the vaccine rollout is that there has been variation in confidence and uptake across different population and subgroups. Um, what we've seen from the evidence is that, um, that racialized communities, um, communities in rural and Northern areas, um, communities with uh, you know, lower socioeconomic status, um, those types of communities have had lower uptake and there can be a number of factors when we talk about vaccine confidence, sometimes that sounds like it's just about confidence in the vaccine, but some of that, some of that, what we could say hesitancy, whatever it might be, is not only based on the information about the vaccines. It can be based on not feeling comfortable to be vaccinated in a large vaccination clinic and preferring um, a familiar community-based and trusted sort of source, whether it's 
um, primary care provider uh, pharmacy or in a community um, setting that's more welcoming um, from a perspective of, of newcomers, for example. So we do know that there are populations that have had um, have some of those challenges in terms of uptake and barriers. The Public Health Agency of Canada is funding over 100 organizations that include many diverse groups. Um, some of which are operating at the local and community level. We're funding um, many community health centers, um, science-based centers, um, cultural associations and groups, faith-based groups um, across the country to help support and bring, um, sometimes it's vaccine ambassadors, sometimes those, those folks are helping with um, appointment scheduling or transportation or meeting some of the basic needs that will help allow someone to have access to vaccination. So um, we can certainly share information um, through Children's Healthcare Can about the Immunization Partnership Fund and the over 100 projects that we're funding right now across the country. Um, to sort of share some of that. We know that provinces and territories are also working with a lot of community partners, with universities, with um, healthcare provider organizations, uh, with faith-based groups to support um, access to vaccination across the country, because we know that um, in public health, local is really where a lot of that important um, activity and support has come from. Thank you. Um, a couple of uh, final questions. One is, um, how is mis or disinformation tracked by the federal government, or or is it? And what's the most effective way to combat it? Um, the questions are to engage with it directly, to focus on uh, developing skills in the critical consumption of information. What 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 would you advise? Really uh, good question. Um, on the tracking front, there's a number of tools that we use. We do social media listening to understand what's out there in the, in the social media spheres in terms of some of the key trends and um, examples of mis or disinformation. We also do you know, media monitoring and analysis um, and uh, look at Google Trends and some other sources of that and bring multiple sources together, including a public opinion research surveys and also listening to partners and hearing from partners and organizations. I wouldn't say that there's one most effective way to address um, mis and disinformation. Thank you for sharing um, the link to Science Up First. Digital Public Square is another a project that we funded that has been um, effective in this space of, of mis and disinformation. Um, there's there's actually some myths and mis and disinformation too. One of which is that if you you know challenge a mis or disinformation directly, that it can result in in a greater problem or a greater challenge. But in fact, what we see is that when when the broader public is quiet about not challenging mistruths, then those mistruths can be allowed to sort of echo and grow and amplify. But when we have seen, um, whether it's social media dialogue or other narratives where um, can, can, you know, individual Canadians and healthcare providers are posting, are sharing um, credible information, are saying, I'm really concerned about this, or I'm seeing the connection between those things in a fact-based way, in an open, non-judgmental way, that's actually been quite effective. So in Canada, when we had, um, you know, there was some misinformation floating around, but when we had a big outpouring of healthcare provider and public dialogue online about those issues, really sharing that we're excited about the opportunity for boosters, or they're really happy that children can finally get vaccinated, that really overshowed, uh, overshot, I don't know if the right word is, sorry, um, overshadowed <laughs> in a positive way and crowded out the misinformation. So we know that that's one important way to do it. Um, and so actually what we do see is that healthcare providers have been incredibly challenged throughout the whole pandemic, whether it's on the front lines um, or in strategy development um, and in vaccination. And we can understand why they've um, felt sometimes very much under attack, but in fact, the voices of healthcare providers online has been a really successful area in which misinformation has been able to be um, discounted um, in, in the public um, you know, sphere as a whole. So certainly being direct, um, sh continuing to share those really important sources, and also just asking questions, um, asking questions to kind of poke holes into what, you know, what sounds like it could be legitimate, but is in fact based on on misinformation. Those are the, some of the techniques that can address that. Our, our vaccine confidence info bulletin um, also includes sort of techniques and ways to debunk or, or the types of sources of bias within misinformation. So um, some of those resources are we can certainly share afterwards as well. Uh, thank you. And we'll post them on the uh, website. Um, there's uh, one final question related to building trust in healthcare and in government. Um, 
I think sharing some of these resources and providing only fact-based information is among them. But what else can we do to help folks who, for a variety of different reasons, um, lack trust in a variety of different systems? How can we help build that trust back in the public in vaccines, both COVID and routine immunizations? I think that um, part of building back trust um, will take multiple different approaches but what it probably comes down to also just even in individual interactions whether between healthcare providers and patients or within families and communities is finding those areas of shared interest like what are the common things that we agree on like the the, the importance of values um the the centrality of health um you know caring about family first those are the types of things that i think when when professionals when governments when organizations focus on the things that we know care you know, mean the most that's where we can find the common space to build back the trust so that they understand um what we're help, trying to help achieve which is them having the right information and the right supports um in order to make the decision themselves um, and to be supported in that whenever that is without judgment without blaming without division i think um, the, the types of strategies and, and inadvertently that have created more division or made people feel like they were excluded and not included um, or didn't have access to things, those things are, do not help build trust. We know the things that build trust are our partnership, our compromise, our um, supporting people and coming um, with their concerns first and foremost. I think those are the types of techniques over time that are going to help build trust, uh, both in vaccines as well as in you know, health systems and governments. Thank you. That's the end of our time today. And I wanna thank you, Dr. Robinson, for sharing your time and expertise in what was a, a very helpful um, and timely presentation. Thank you to all our members and other at attendees for choosing to join us. We know how busy you are right now. We hope you depart with some practical knowledge to bring back to your organization. Join us for upcoming Spark offerings. Tomorrow, April 7th, Children's Healthcare Canada is hosting an invitational pop-up event focused on mental health leadership. Later this month, on April 25th, we'll release another podcast related to immunization, all about COVID's impact on routine vaccination, featuring our special guest, Dr. Manish Sadarangai. Uh, Sadarangani, sorry, my terrible pronunciation there. Um, and April 21st to 28th is also National Immunization Awareness Week. Keep an eye on our website, social media, and newsletter for more announcements. It's always great if you can watch live as your question and comments really enrich the discussion. But if you can't, the recordings of these sessions are made available after the fact on our Knowledge Exchange Network. So thanks for joining us today. Thank you to Dr. Robinson for this presentation, and hopefully we'll see many of you back here soon. Bye, everyone.